three first-class performances, all of which are probably among the best he's ever done. 20 minutes after 12 is the time. Um, Natasha Clark, LBC's political editor, is with me. I, I, I'm not quite sure what we just witnessed there. Who is that man? It's I don't recognise him. I'm actually appearing at the Comedy Store tonight, which is pretty unlikely, I grant you, and, and highly incongruous, although I'm not expected to do actual comedy. Are you sure? Ke- Ke- pretty sure. Keir Starmer was doing stand-up there. He was. He was having a, a proper panto moment, yes. wasn't he? It was and, end and of dealing tone dealing with Christmas. hecklers in quite yeah. an effective fashion. Yeah, James Cleverly, nonetheless, heckling him from the mm. front bench and being repeatedly told off by the speaker to calm down. Um, yeah, absolute panto season. Um, I think a Christmas wrap-up of what has been a bit of a terrible year worked quite well for Keir Starmer with lots and lots of jokes, lots of puns thrown in there. And he's just getting more comfortable with making these jokes, isn't he? Yes, um, and he's, yes. he's appearing to to be more at ease uh, at Prime Minister's Questions. And I remember when he first got up at Prime Minister's Questions, he came across as really lawyery and you know mm. like he was facing another lawyer uh, in a courtroom and it didn't quite work and he's clearly taken on some good advice from his advisors lately uh and apparently some of these jokes are and this this, this new shift in yeah. strategy is all coming from him people really? in the labor party are saying really yeah they're saying this is just decided it's coming from people. him well do you know natasha that quite a few people who have right, so i've interviewed him on stage and found a very different human being Mm-hmm. from the one that I see being interviewed, even on the radio, even when I'm doing the interview myself on the radio. So he's perhaps made a... a he's realised that he needs to be more like he actually is inside, outside, so and, to speak. Yeah, and I mean, all the focus groups say, oh, kids, Dom is a bit boring, isn't he? So maybe he's trying to be a bit less boring, maybe it's that, but I think it is working. And but it's it's authentic, so yeah. I, I mean, quite a lot of people picking up on that. I'll choose Pete. Starmer was powerful, amusing, intelligent and engaging. Sunak seemed to just be petulant in response, because the, there's nothing worse than trying to be funny or yeah. trying to deliver a script, a joke, and not being very but good at it. But that's what he used to do. Yes, exactly. He used to try really hard to do that, and he used to try really hard to be, you know, this cool, uh, you know, funny man, but it just didn't come across. But now it feels like he actually is. And uh, yeah, like I say, I don't know what's changed, but clearly whether it's he's feeling more confident, whether the polls um, Mm. and obviously, you know, coming up to the end of the year and as we look into 2024 uh, at an election, maybe he's just feeling a bit more confident about his chances of winning another election. But he was incredibly uh, good just then, um, you know, going from Making a very making very serious points to making very funny points mm. without it sounding too crass. Um, he you know he wasn't sounding too pessimistic as well. He's p- pointing out that you know Britain's had a really difficult year. There's got lots of problems, but without sounding too you know moaning mini about it. Yeah, I'm or not... even celebratory. You know because the other lot are having a nightmare. You can sometimes sound as if you're crowing. Exactly, and he didn't sound like that at all. He sound, I think he got the tone pretty much bang on right. And then and proper it poignancy well. at the end there. Proper yeah. Point. And then up st- Stephen Flynn to just slap Rishi Sunak around the head with the Israel-Gaza scenario and Sunak sounding, I mean, I, I, Joe Biden's probably been moved further towards criticising Israel than Rishi Sunak mm-hmm. has managed to do in he the has last indeed. 24 hours. Yeah, I do note that Rishi Sunak uh, just then said, we support a ceasefire in these certain circumstances. Mm. That felt like a little bit of a shift mm. on the Gaza to me in terms of his language. Um, so there was that. But yes, he did absolutely body blow him with that. Why is a hun- why are 153 countries uh, mm. right to call for a ceasefire, but we are not? That's a fantastic way of, of asking that question. Um, Sunak, I, I, mean, I don't know if he has any choice, but to repeatedly claim that you're doing a brilliant job seems like quite an odd flex in the circumstances, when you've lost control of your own party, never mind the country. Yeah, totally. And, and Keir Starmer was quick to correct him on the economic statistics mm-hmm. out today that the economy is actually actually well, contracted as well. well. That on air, I mean, we did that when mm-hmm. he was speaking. I said to you, I thought it had just gone down yeah, by 0.3%. It has, exactly. So, and Keir, you know, has been reading the headlines and knows it has. Yeah. So he's, he's on the ball. And yes, Rishi Sunak does risk coming across a little bit tin-eared, a little bit tone-deaf. And he clearly has not spent as much time preparing for this PMQ's appearance as, as Keir Starmer did today did he he's wow, probably been dealing with other point. things that's um, a very good point and obviously you know the fallout from from this Rwanda vote and this migration vote maybe he's perhaps spent less time preparing for this session than he usually would do um martin suggests starmer has gone from kavanaugh qc to my cousin Vinny. <laughs> that's martin and Katari. i love that film uh, my cousin Vinny. um that's a very good point and and he did something else which i don't think he's done before by 
and and there is a degree of opportunism in PMQs, even though his sincerity on the on the case of the little lad whose toys are all in storage is unquestionable. It it kind of spiked Sunak's guns a bit because that, of course, was the final question. I think the one to which Sunak would normally respond with the pre-prepared comments attack, designed attack for the, lines, for the, the news really, bulletins, really the attack stuff. lines yeah. designed for the news bulletins. But he almost reached for the attack lines early and making those unfounded claims about the economy and about other issues as well. But then asking to send a message to a homeless little boy as the sixth question, mm. difficult for Sunak then to stand up and uh, offer up anything it really, was. without sounding heartless. He did. And, you know, he also came across quite shouty, Sikis, uh, so Rishi Sunak mm. in that prime minister's questions he didn't come across as tetchy as he sometimes does come across a little bit irritated and a little bit angsty but he came he was quite loud it felt in your ears that the, the prime minister was shouting at you um down the line that's kind of how i felt um and yes it was it was it was not pleasant he didn't he came across as on the back foot and sakir starmer was yet again on the front foot and he's had a good run as we've been discussing it was the penultimate question wasn't it about the homeless child because the final question was just inviting rishi sunak to join Keir Starmer in offering up a happy Christmas to everybody. Exactly. What a nice question. And he fluffed that exactly. as well. Exactly. Couldn't, couldn't even just bat that one back. Um, yes, yeah, so obviously this is the last Prime Minister's questions of the year. His, Keir Starmer has obviously been preparing for this one to really uh, stick the welly and stick the boot in in his final, final time in 2023 uh, with the Prime Minister obviously on the back foot from last night's Rwanda vote and that fallout. Um, I think, you know, he had a lot to go on, didn't he? <sighs> I mean, that's, so that's three on the bounce for Keir Starmer, really. Yeah, I think three, so. Three first-class performances, all of which are probably among the best he's ever done. I love a fight in politics, so yeah. I was really hoping that Rishi Sunak would um, would give it some welly and give him a fight back and give us all a reason to say, actually, no, I think he won that one uh, best of three. Yeah. Um, but no, it did seem that it's yet another good... It's a knockout. And he also three three. did, I mean, a really awful response when Starmer pointed out that some of Sunak's colleagues have been giving very... Uh, critical quotes That's to the fantastic. newspaper. That's fantastic. That was great. It? Just throwing all of these insults that all of these anonymous Tory MPs have been doing in the yeah. papers. And I feel like Keir Starmer has done that before. Um, I can't I can't remember the, Put your the hand exact up. date. Put your hand up. Was it Exactly. You? Who was it? Was I mean, it that's you? Where was he it was, you? That's where he was like a stand-up yeah. in a, in a, in a it, comedy It was room. very... It's, I expect him to go, they're behind you. Yes, yes. <laughs> and soon that responded that effectively by saying, I know you are, but what am I? By saying, yeah. you should hear what they say about you. Ooh, what about you, mate? No one likes you. Not good. Not good at all. Yeah, and then start talking about education which as far as I know no one's really spoken about this week um, I, I that know looked a bit desperate it looked like he was reaching or reeling for, for anything to talk about other than the things the, the, the territory into which Keir Starmer was, was leading him um, we've got a couple of minutes before the news just to step back a little uh, how much trouble is he in? I think he's still in a bit of trouble. I mean, the fact that we had a, quite a chunky number of Conservatives abstain on that vote last night, so uh, 37 if you include the people who were slipped, 29 if you include the people who did not have an excuse not to be there. Uh, that's a sizable chunky majority. But the fact that they blinked in the face of that uh, vote last night, instead of voting it down, they decided, oh, let's just abstain against it, shows that actually I think number 10 this tonight uh, to this, today will be mm. saying... Actually, we feel a little bit more confident that the rebels probably don't have the numbers to get an amendment through to try and wreck this legislation. And actually, I think they will be sleeping a bit better in the next few days. Um, and is there a clock ticking? I, I mean, it's so hard to work out which deadlines apply here. The, the, the next election is a, as yet unspecified date. Mm -hmm. Getting planes into the air before it, they've bet the house on, albeit that I'm not persuaded at all that the public are remotely as interested in that prospect or as concerned by that prospect as the Conservative Party has uh, rendered itself desperate for. Um, uh, and then you've got the prospect of the bill coming back in January yeah, yeah. and the amendments. Is that a clock that ticks? Or? It is, but it's a slow one, isn't it? So we're expecting the third reading, I think, not until the very end of January. So that's a bit of a slow burn and it's not really emer this emergency legislation that we were promised. You know, it's not quite as quick as I think some people would have preferred it to be. And it does mean that the, the chances of getting any of these planes off to Rwanda by the next election are now looking vanishingly small, especially if it's, it's, it turns out to be a, an early May perhaps June election. Do you I think just, that's a plausible? I think there is... What are the odds? So, we're playing 3D chess with this here. Um, mm. It changes on a day... My opinion changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Look very much like a Boris Johnson trolley, depending on who I've <laughs> spoken to. Um, but at the moment, I think 
if he can't get bits of legislation like this through, if he runs into another problem, or if, you know, I'm completely wrong and the, the right wing of the Conservative Party all gather round together on this one amendment and threaten to vote the whole thing down, and he can't get this through, he's stuck. And if you're a prime minister that can't get legislation through, you have to call an election. So that's where we'll be next. That's that, personally that's the, where and I this is where think it gets it Brexity. This is or, where it gets Theresa May reminiscent. Yeah. So there'll be an amendment. And all of these five groups, whatever they call themselves, will Star be on the same page. Yeah, may, maybe. But the chances are it probably won't happen in Brexit. You saw it right across the Conservative yeah. Party. MPs left, right and centre saying different things. Mm. The only other suggestion for a general election early that I could see is if the Supreme Court or another court blocks these flights and then Rishi Sunak says well they've been blocked I must call an election if you if you're with me yeah. but you know does he want to make a whole election it's not salience with the electorate exactly either. do you it's not a brexit uh, issue no. you can't just say so it's like a get Rwanda done type of I just play. don't think that's going to win you an election no it's not I don't even know if it's going to win you any votes